Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Strategy at Tripwire. And today, I am joined by Lisa Forte, partner at Red Goat Cybersecurity. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited for this conversation. I think... Um, Every every cybersecurity practitioner sort of dreads that moment when they they realize that a breach has actually occurred, you know that their their data has been copied or encrypted or that phone call potentially from a third party telling them that their their data has been found available for sale somewhere online. And Lisa, you you actually specialize in that moment that most of us are are really dreading and trying to avoid. Yes, this is my area of expertise. So I watch CEOs, CFOs, CTOs panic and bury their heads in their hands as I uh, run scenarios for them to to test their their plans and their teamwork and things like this. So speaking of scenarios, I wanted to structure our conversation today sort of in two scenarios. The, the first one being what uh, this kind of an incident, a breach looks like for an unprepared organization. And then in scenario two, we'll talk a little bit about how that's different for a well-prepared organization. How does that sound? The naughty child and, and the well-behaved child. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's start with that scenario one. We've got an unprepared organization. What's likely the first thing that happens with that type of an organization when, it, when a breach occurs? So it, it's, it's interesting, actually. Um, I've actually found that um, the more unprepared an organization is, the more tempted they are to lie or try and conceal what's happening. So it's really interesting because if you run a scenario with a company that's done no preparation whatsoever, their go-to immediate knee-jerk reaction is almost always, um, could we just say that the website was down? Or could we just say that um, the data hasn't actually been leaked or this hasn't really happened? And you sort of sit there and you're thinking, mm, you could say that. I mean, it can, it can literally come out of your mouth. I'm not sure that's where we want to go as a strategy. And I think it's because there is no plan. There is no, you know, they're, they're in this moment of what on earth do I do in this situation? So because of that, they decide the best thing to do is just deny it. Well, and it's really interesting. The, the psychology there, I think, is really interesting because uh, you know, as practitioners, I think we we if you're in the information security industry, you, you kind of understand that that every organization is potentially a victim, no matter how well prepared they are. Uh, there's still the potential that uh, a really well resourced adversary is going to manage to compromise them. But if you're inherent, if you feel like you're already unprepared or you weren't prepared for this incident, that that idea that your first instinct is is sort of defensive, that to sort of lay blame somewhere else is a it's just an interesting psychological difference that you know you'd look for that 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 place to put blame that isn't somehow on your own unpreparedness i guess yeah i think it's sort of a bit like when we were children you know and like you know i had a sister um and if i god forbid broke an ornament or or something of my mother's um whilst playing I would sort of tentatively try and put it back in such a way as to kind of look like it could have been my sister. Yeah. Um, and I sort of think that's where we still are as adults when we're not prepared and we think, oh my God, I'm going to be in so much trouble. This is so bad. We've made all these mistakes. We don't have a plan. How are we going to deal with it? Let's just try and blame someone else or blame something else and get out of it. You know, and I think that that, that psychology has kind of carried over to our adult lives on some level. But but in this case, there is someone else to blame because there there is actually an attacker who has malicious intent in most of these cases. And that, so it's interesting that in the with the existence of someone who you could actually blame, who has committed likely a criminal act, we still often choose to sort of try and deflect blame from ourselves onto something that, that isn't that attacker. I, it's, right. uh, I haven't thought too much about it, but it's interesting. 
I think also, though, if you're an organization that has absolutely no semblance whatsoever of a plan of what you're going to do, the chances of you having really robust cybersecurity defenses, really well thought out asset management plans and and risk assessments is probably pretty low. Mm -hmm. So I would think that generally speaking, if you're really, really that unprepared, you probably haven't done what you should have done to protect your data in the first place. So you're probably also aware of that fact mm. and that that might come knocking at your door. Mm. Yeah, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. So do you think, so this, so we've, we've talked about, you know, that, that first thing that happens is that instinct to, to lay blame somewhere else or to hide the, the incident. Is that, is that the first mistake that you see unprepared organizations make? Or is there a, another sort of, do they generally avoid that first mistake and make some other first mistake? Some it, it can go either way. Sometimes they go for it and they sort of say, oh, yeah, no, nothing's happened. And I'm sure we can all think of cases in the last couple of years where we've seen big organizations um, apply that methodology. What I tend to find is the thing that is really showing, the thing that really is obvious to the public is the communications are really terrible. So the company either doesn't put out any communications at all about what's going on and how they're trying to fix the situation or they're really muddled, or another thing you'll see happen with an unprepared organization is they'll come out immediately and say, we're not paying the ransom, no way. And that's always a red flag because it kind of highlights that they probably aren't considering it from a business perspective. And whilst on a moral level, we all deeply think that this is not something you should do, it is a business consideration. And often you then find they pay the ransom and then they have to backtrack, which also looks really terrible. So communications are something that really you can't just kind of ad hoc and make up on the fly. You have to really think them through. How much do you think, so in those cases where an organization says we're not paying the ransom and then they, they end up paying it, uh, how much do you think that actually the public actually realizes that that occurred? I, I find myself wondering if, if that initial statement of we're not paying the ransom is what gets remembered and reported, and then the eventual payment of the ransom is sort of a, a secondary event that doesn't really get any publicity. I mean, I think it depends really on, on the situation. I think the cybersecurity community, the InfoSec community, are pretty tuned in, and I think it becomes pretty obvious that someone's probably paid the ransom when suddenly everything is restored very quickly. Hmm. So I don't think it's something you can necessarily hide um, hugely. But again, it, it goes to indicate that you haven't got a great plan because you haven't even, you know, one of the things I've been doing a lot this year is is writing ransomware policies for companies. So, you know, in which circumstances would we pay the ransom, um, getting the board to pre-approve that sort of scenario. Mm-hmm. And that's the sign of being prepared because actually saying... It's very, very rare that I see a company that says, absolutely no, under any circumstances, never would we pay. Well, and they might say that up uh, as a starting point, but once you start outlining the, the details and the potential circumstances they could find themselves in, it starts to, to become a little more real and they, they have to adjust. Totally, yeah. Yeah. So is that, what would you, let's shift a little bit from the, the first mistake that organizations make when they're they're unprepared, this unprepared scenario. To what's generally the biggest mistake that you see unprepared organizations make? I think some of the biggest mistakes. So, so one of the things it's actually a human thing, to be honest. Um, and often what it, what happens is a crisis management team or CMT, you know, the people who run a strategic level crisis uh, within an organization. You know, these people, unless your company is particularly unlucky or com- or particularly incompetent. Um, you're probably not handling a crisis every day, right? That's, that's, it's probably pretty rare as an occurrence. So what that means is that the people who are on your crisis management team have actually very little practice in running a crisis and handling mm-hmm. pressure and making decisions and delegating and working as a team. And so if you haven't planned and run exercises, what you end up finding is that there is no real leader in the crisis management team. It's chaos. No one owns responsibilities. You've got the wrong people. You need HR and you haven't got HR and all this sort of stuff starts happening. And it's the wrong time to realize that in the middle of a cyber attack. 
And how how many organizations really actually have a crisis management team to to start with? I mean, I would think that that larger organizations that would be pretty common for them to have set up at least some framework. Um, but smaller and mid sized organizations, I can imagine they they might not have done that work. Totally. And again, you know, with business continuity managers, often in very large organizations, you'll have an individual who has that role. But then in smaller organizations, the chances are if that role exists at all, it's probably lumped with the CISO's role or the head of IT, which, you know, they've got a lot of other things that they have to do, right? That's like a tiny part of their actual role. So not an area of focus for sure. Exactly. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So that gives us a little bit of a picture of of the the unprepared organization and and what might happen. I think you have you know, described sort of that initial response, which is is crisis driven, and then the the biggest mistake, which is really a lack of of planning. But what's important for a lot of organizations in terms of how to deal with a breach or or an incident are the outcomes. So, what are the what are the preventable outcomes that occur when an organization is unprepared? Like, how does it impact them in a meaningful way? Uh, that lack of preparation. I think one of the most me- meaningful ways that you see is that actually the decision making of the crisis management team or CMT is hampered to such a large extent when you have no planning and you have no rehearsals. And what what that ends up happening is they either make really bad decisions, which is obviously not good, or even worse than that, they make no decisions at all and they're almost completely paralyzed and they don't know who to ask. They don't know where to get information. They're not well versed on, for example, if this service is down, what does that impact from a customer facing perspective and how do we um, build in some resilience and some redundancy to that process? So because they have no familiarity with how anything works, how to make decisions um, and so on and so forth, what you find is that no decisions get made. And it's not the sort of incident where you can do that. You know, it's a fast moving incident. It's a a evolving incident. Um, And so it really relies on people who are confident decision makers who can keep the organization moving forward. I want to take that set of sort of circumstances that you just described and and tie tie it to Ultimately, for most organizations, if they're a a business, a for-profit business, it comes down to money. The inability to make decisions effectively, taking too long to make them, making the wrong decisions because you you didn't have a plan, all of that ends up prolonging the breach, causing potentially the loss of data, loss of customers. It all comes back to that incident ultimately costing that business more money than it needed to. Is that a, a reasonable way to think about it? Yeah, definitely. And I think the one thing that you can, you know, I talk about this a lot when I talk about, um, you know, what the sort of losses are from cyber attacks and from breaches. By and large, the ones that you can almost certainly depend on happening are recovery costs are always going to be there. Um, mm-hmm. And they can be substantial. Um, you often underestimate, certainly smaller businesses will often underestimate this. Businesses will also not necessarily have already... Um, brought on forensic companies, for instance, or lawyers who they've already onboarded. So they're then forced to do that under extreme pressure in a cyber attack, in a crisis, Mm -hmm. where, let's be honest, you just don't have negotiating power at that point to drive the price down. Exactly. You're desperate. They'll whack up the price. If you get them at all, it will be a nightmare. So that will always cost a lot of money. And then the sort of secondary thing that flows sort of I suppose later on from the breach is sort of class action or group action lawsuits that might come from individual consumers, mm. which again, you know, if that's a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars per person, that doesn't sound like much. But if you have 200, 300,000 customers, that's suddenly quite a large amount of money. 
Well, and it's interesting because we we talked a little bit about you know making bad decisions or making no decisions as uh, causing the breach to take a longer time time to resolve, but but there's also that aspect of creating liability through your poor decision making or your lack of decision making that turns into that kind of a lawsuit and ultimately has significant costs down the line. Yeah, and this is exactly also why you know seeking legal counsel early on is really really valuable because again when you're having that legal advice during an incident that might be subject to legal privilege which means it's not necessarily disclosable um if in a class action lawsuit situation so mm. if you're getting that advice from a lawyer on what you should do um it's privileged so people won't be able to see it whereas if you're not instructing a lawyer early on all of that is potentially stuff that you have to disclose the other cost that that occurs to me that i think people don't don't necessarily think about is the the lost uh, opportunity cost, if you will, of that breach. So all of this money that you're spending to resolve the breach um, is really unbudgeted funding. So it's not money you spent on planning because nobody's planning to spend money on a, on, a, on a breach. And that means it's coming out of somewhere else in your business. And I think that's an important consideration as well, that you're losing the opportunity to spend that funding on something that, that is, you know, would, would be designed to grow your business as opposed to resolving the breach. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think people haven't, necess- as you said, they haven't budgeted for it. They haven't thought it through. And why would you, you know? So I think um, I think it's definitely things that, that need to be considered. I mean, for example, ransomware, people don't necessarily realize that you can't just set up a Bitcoin wallet in two seconds, buy Bitcoin and pay a ransom in, mm. you know, two seconds. That doesn't apl- that doesn't happen. You probably need board approval. It's going to take time to set up the Bitcoin wallet, buy the Do you even know how to purchase Bitcoin? Lots of organizations wouldn't even know that. And so the longer that's delayed, the the more likely that price is mm. going up from an attacker's perspective as well. I might start asking people what their what their budget for ransomware payments is and see see what kind of a response they get. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even sure you probably want to be holding Bitcoin in your Bitcoin wallet, though. Uh, I think yeah. it's a rather volatile kind of a, a currency that maybe it's you'd end true. up losing more money from that. You might, or, or making money like, or day to day, who knows? <laughs> all depends uh, on Elon Musk. We have to just right. wait and see what, what he tweets. What Elon Musk has to say. But it's interesting because, you know, in survey after survey, in, in market research after market research, ransomware shows up as like the top concern that, that practitioners have today. Yep. It would be reasonable, given that it's a top concern, for organizations to actually set aside budget for paying ransom. Um, but I'm pretty sure they don't. It's just a, an interesting little contradiction. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. I want to shift the scenario um, from that unprepared organization to the well-prepared organization. Uh, you know, although you you specialize in helping organizations prepare, that 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 means you probably encounter more unprepared folks than prepared folks, or maybe you leave them better prepared would be the way to look at it. <laughs> but what what are the key differences that you see uh, when you encounter a well-prepared organization versus that unprepared scenario? So there's two, I would say there's two categories of well-prepared organization. There's actually well-prepared organizations, and there's organizations that think they are well-prepared, and the two are not necessarily the same. Mm. So the people who think they're well-prepared usually in my experience, will have absolutely beautiful plans, playbooks for everything. It looks on paper absolutely perfect. When you run an exercise, you will realize very, very quickly that the plans are usually overcomplicated. People don't understand them. They're unusable. They make presumptions that just simply aren't reality. Um, And it all actually in practice falls apart. The actually well-prepared organizations are ones that have run an exercise, improved their plans, run another exercise, improved their plans further. And it's that ongoing process that leaves them in a position where their CMT are super confident, their plans are really robust, and they know exactly where their weaknesses are. This seems like an important distinction, that, that, that being well-prepared doesn't simply mean having a response plan. It actually is a process of continually exercising that plan and continually improving it as you go through those exercises. 
Yeah, totally. Because often, and you know, I'll, I'll be guilty of this. I'm sure everyone who's listening to this is guilty of this. You will write something down that you think is absolutely genius. When you try to execute it or bring it into practice, you realize that certain bits of it work academically, but aren't practical, you know, aren't practical in reality. So that's why you have to exercise the plan and test the scenarios. Yeah. I mean, often we create things for ourselves that, that, that might work with the assumption that we're the one using it, but people are different. And so having a plan that actually anyone uh, in the organization as part of that CMT c- could effectively execute, uh, that's actually a really challenging task. It is. And I think the other thing that's perhaps even more challenging is in a lot of organizations. So I often say to people, when you have your CMT, when you have you know your representative from each department, on your crisis management team, they as a team need to elect a chairperson because what you really need in a crisis is you need one single person who can essentially run through agenda items, make sure actions are owned, et cetera, et cetera. And the default in a lot of organizations is to allocate the CEO to that position. And Mm. that's just purely from a sort of hierarchical superiority perspective. But actually, the person in that position needs to be the most capable individual under pressure. And that may well be the HR lady, or it may well be the CIO, or it may well be whoever. You know, it depends on their individual characteristics, which you won't know until you've run exercises. Yeah, that's that's also an interesting point, that those exercises might might not just, they might change certainly might change the plan itself but they might also change the roles that people play based on how those exercises uh you know pan out which is a a, something that people don't think about necessarily roles often when we think about job roles we think about them as being fairly immutable like this is my job and i'm responsible for it as opposed to you know finding who the best person is to fit that role and a a crisis management team is a is different than a, a job assignment really yeah, totally. And you, you, you if you don't um, test out, you know, there are some people who are absolutely excellent at their actual day to day jobs, absolutely superb, but just simply can't handle a crisis and that pressure just from their personality. So there's no point having them on your CMT, but you also don't want to discover that in the middle of an absolutely crucial cyber attack or, or data breach, right? Yeah, that seems like a really tough uh tough scenario to play out because no matter how realistic you make the tabletop exercise, it's never going to have the same level of pressure as a real incident. How, do you have any, any tips for how to resolve that, how to, how to simulate the kind of pressure that you might experience in a real incident? So I always say that the, the purpose of these exercises is to build confidence. You want to build confidence in your CMT. So it's always good just to start off as a sort of tabletop kind of gentle PowerPoint type scenario. And as they get more used to running exercises, you can build them up. So one of the ones I ran um, a few years ago, we had fire, ambulance, police involvement in it. It was in a port. So we actually had simulated bodies with blood everywhere and we had drones and we had um, all sorts of things Um, we hired a load of people to play journalists so we actually walked the CEO out of the building and had him accosted by journalists um, trying to ask him questions so you, you can actually make them sort of a bit like a film obviously if your CMT have never run an exercise before and you do that to them you are probably going to get an incredibly bad response. So it's probably about... be looking for a new CMT because they've all left. <laughs> exactly. So you want to build the confidence of those people up and then start introducing more immersive elements to it. But I mean, I think it's a great awareness raising tool for your staff generally as well, because they can see that we're playing this game where we're pretending we're under attack and this is what we're doing. And it really helps you reinforce some of those security awareness training lessons that you've implemented in your general population of staff as well. That brings us to the the where we left the unprepared organization with the, the bad outcomes. How does the, the outcome differ when you have a well-prepared organization? Okay, so I think, you know, we can look at some of the companies that have that have come off well, you know, and I think one of them that particularly stands out is Maersk, the shipping company. 
Mm. Um, and what was really interesting about that was that after their ransomware attack, in fact, instead of the media sort of jumping on them and accusing them of not doing X, Y, and Z, they were actually labeled heroes. Their IT team were labeled heroes by the media, which is just unheard of from a cyber attack perspective. Yeah. And the, the, they did two really interesting things that they did absolutely excellently. And I know they've written this up on their website. Um, but the first one was they communicated completely openly and transparently to the public. The second one which is actually more interesting, was they turned to their staff and they said, you do whatever you think is right to serve our customers and we'll pick up the bill later. Just make sure our customers are happy. And that delegation meant that the senior people on the team didn't have to keep asking, getting asked questions about, can we do this and can we do that? Mm. They just went and did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guarantee there were mistakes that were made in that process for Maersk. But they, they're they overshadowed by the, the positive performance. And if they had worried about those individual mistakes, they would have ended up with a, a much worse outcome, ultimately. Yeah, no, totally. And I'm sure there was, you know, the, the, the chairman of Maersk actually said that he thought that they were probably average at best at cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, and they learned a lot of lessons from this cyber attack. And I just think that honesty really resonated with the public. It just seemed really refreshing. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we brought up this point uh, earlier in the conversation about how um, an organization that, that hasn't, doesn't feel like it's done the best job of cybersecurity in general is more likely to want to lay blame somewhere else or to hide the fact that there was a breach because they feel like it's, it's their fault for not being prepared. And it sounds like Maersk, if they said they were, they were probably average, maybe that's enough. There's got to be a threshold there at which that tra- level of transparency and honesty is, is acceptable. Because if they if they were incredibly poor at cybersecurity, I think the outcome might have been different. What, do, do, does that make sense? Would you agree? Yeah, no, I I, I see your point, and I think I, I always say to people when they say, "Okay, so open communications." Do I just tell everybody everything? And I say, I always say, "Oh, for God's sake, please don't tell everybody everything." You definitely don't want to come out and say, oh, "We have absolutely no idea what's going on. All we know is we've lost everything." You know, you obviously you you want to tailor everything to fit a narrative that you want. But I think one thing that's really clear by being uh, one of the key benefits, I suppose, of it, of, of being so open and transparent or seemingly open and transparent, shall we say, is that you get ahead of the narrative. And what you'll see often uh, in InfoSec on Twitter, for instance, is that if an organization doesn't come out and say, this is what's happened, we're working mm-hmm. on it, we'll update you, people come up with their own theories and mm-hmm. then what happens is the organization has to put out fires by saying this isn't true, that's not true, instead of running their own narrative of what's happening. Yeah, and it, it is entirely possible to put out a statement that doesn't have enough information to set that narrative. So you still end up with the, the same problem. So there's a there's a, a fine line to walk there between providing too much information. As you said, you don't want to disclose everything and providing enough information, just enough to set that narrative so that you don't end up in that situation of being defensive against all of the the rumors and theories that that people come up with. Totally. And this is why we write our comms templates before the incident happens and we can then tailor them, but they've had enough thought to go into them in a sort of calm time as opposed to when we're in panic. We're almost out of time here and there's actually a lot more I'd, I'd like to talk about around building an incident response plan itself. But I think the takeaway here is that the biggest difference between an unprepared and prepared organization, well-prepared organization, is doing that planning, but not just having the plan, actually running the exercises. Um, for me, I think that was the the big epiphany in this conversation, is that it's not just about having a plan. It's actually about exercising that plan over and over again. And if you're not doing that, then you're you're not really prepared. Yeah, I think that's that sums it up perfectly. So for all of those of you who are listening, if you haven't run through your incident response plan and some kind of exercise lately, now's the time to schedule it uh, and make sure that that's happening regularly. And Lisa, I want to thank you for the time. It was a really interesting conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me on. Excellent. And thanks to everyone who was listening. Uh, I hope you'll tune in for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.
You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.